Good evening, everybody. Welcome to another Perceptive Podcast here on Game Wisdom, where we examine the art and science of games. This is our first official recording post-GDC. For those of you listening to this cast, it should be about mid-March. But GDC, of course, happened in the end of February, and now all the developers are back and hopefully recovering and ready to talk to us some more about their games. Unfortunately, James couldn't make it for tonight's recording, but we got a great cast nonetheless. We're going to be catching up with Yacht Club Games and, of course, their big hit Shovel Knight, which at the time of this recording is currently available on Nintendo Switch, and they are working on getting the next expansion out for PC and other builds at the moment. We're also going to be talking about the recent topic on quote-unquote modern retro design, or making games with either older design or older aesthetics in the modern market. But let's uh, get things going, and let me welcome our guests for tonight. For older fans of Game Wisdom, you should certainly remember him. We, I think the last time we spoke may have been like two, three years ago on one of our Perceptive Roundtables. But please welcome back from Yacht Club Games, David D'Angelo. Hey, everyone. Hey, Thanks David. It's me. great to have you back on. We were just talking before this, Kaz, that it feels like it's been like a decade since we last spoke. Because <laughs> time, again, doesn't exist for us anymore. <laughs> no, no. I've, I'm, I've been working on Shovel Knight for, my, for at least 100 years. So. <laughs> Yes, and I've been doing Game Wisdom now for about probably that same time. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess to start with, how are you doing, David? I know, um, did you go to GDC this year? Uh, I didn't. I was uh, stuck here trying to get, uh, you know, trying to get Shovel Knight out the door in, our, you know, the new Content Spectre of Torment on mm-hmm. as many consoles as we could during that week. Um Mm-hmm. And just making sure the Switch version went through smooth, smoothly, so I was I was stuck working. Yeah, I know the feeling. I didn't make it out to GC this year, so fingers crossed I'll be able to make it out for next. And as I said before the cast, I definitely want to give a shout out to you and the rest of Yacht Club Games. I said this, I think, the last time you were on, but definitely congratulations on the success of Shovel Knight, especially with the Spectre Knight expansion and getting the game on the Nintendo Switch as a launch title. Yeah, thank you. So I guess uh, one, I guess, quick question about that, since you're our first developer on who's had a chance to like work with the Switch, what did you think about, I guess, porting Shovel Knight to Nintendo Switch? Like, what did you think of the platform? Uh, I mean, it's great. I would say it was, you know, one of the easiest Nintendo uh, platforms we've ever exp- uh, had the experience of porting to, um, you know, especially early on, usually early on, they're, you know, like really really tough to use states like you know it could be anything from a uh you know a motherboard that's sitting on your desk (laughs) to a like fully fleshed machine out machine Uh, and i would say the switch was like really well put together and uh i mean really surprised us how easy it was to develop for it cool i'm hoping at some point in the future to get my hands on switch myself but we shall see and for those of you listening to this cast right now, one of the things that since you've last been on, David, we've been expanding out into YouTube and Twitch, and these podcasts are now going out a lot further with the audio being uploaded to the YouTube channel. For a lot of the newer fans who are listening to this cast, if you didn't know this, and please uh, correct me if I'm wrong about this, David, that a lot of the members from Yacht Club Games originally were from the studio Way Forward. Is that right? Yeah, the the original team, uh, we were essentially transplants from Way Forward. That's correct. Mm-hmm. And Way Forward worked on a lot of like modern 2D platformers. And you guys did Shantae, and I'm I'm sure you guys did a boy in his blob, right? The the Wii remake of that, or the Wii spiritual sequel. Uh, yeah. I mean, everyone at the, uh, you know, from the original team worked on different games there. So uh, it's you know, yeah. we worked the only t- the only game we actually worked together on was Double Dragon Neon, mm. uh, but in various capacities. I mean, I worked on. Uh, I worked on a boy is loved. I worked on uh, Blood Rainbow Trail. I worked on Thor. I worked on Taz, <laughs> Galactic Tazball. I worked on <laughs> Aliens Infestation. I worked on um, 
Mm. I can't even remember anymore. Mighty Milky Way. Uh, <laughs> you know, some of the guys worked on Contra 4. Uh, so, I mean, we, were, we really worked on a lot, of, a lot of different games in a lot of different capacities. Yeah. And for those of you listening to this cast, like I said, uh, we, we've spoken several times in the past. I know, I think my first cast with Yacht Club, I think, was with two of the other members. And then I think you came on for cast number two. So we've certainly talked about Shovel Knight's history and the Kickstarter before. And if I can find links to those podcasts, they will be in the notes below. So we won't be um, focusing too much on the past with Shovel Knight, because if we did, we'll probably be here for about two, three hours easily if we uh, <laughs> brought all that in. So I guess to get the ball rolling for tonight, David, uh, my first, I guess, actual question regarding what's been going on is for the folks listening, how are things going with the Spectre Knight expansion right now? Uh, well, I mean, we we're really happy with what we made. Uh, I mean, like a lot of the team here thinks it's the best game we've ever made. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't mean to toot our own horn <laughs> or anything, but like, I mean, we we're really happy with how it came out. It feels it's much faster. It's much more concise mm-hmm. um, than you know, the Shovel Knight campaign is, but still has a lot of like the, you know, quirky story and interesting characters. Uh, and the mobility is like a really interesting and fresh and new and something you haven't seen before, I think. Yeah. Uh, yeah. In terms of, but you know, getting the messaging out there, I would say is like what we're struggling with a lot right now. I, I would say a lot of people don't know it's out on switch mm-hmm. or they just don't know. Oh, it's like, it's really a full new game. I mean, we've been describing a lot yeah. like, you know, it's maybe our Majora's mass to Ocarina of time. Yeah. Uh, like it's really that it's that it level of new and different. Mm hmm. Yeah, and um, when when I took a chance, or when I took a look at Plague Knight, and I recently did a video on Shovel Knight for the YouTube channel, basically part of my new series dissecting design. One of the things I really did enjoy about uh, going from Shovel Knight to Plague Knight was how it didn't feel like just a copy and paste job. You didn't just you know take the Plague Knight model, put them in the same exact levels, and call it a day. It felt like a completely original experience and i think your example your analogy of ocarina of time to majora's mask certainly fits here because both games use the same engine they both had the same look and feel but they were just completely different games built on like the same similar foundation yeah we we, we've been describing them essentially as as uh ocarina of time uh plague knight is ocarina of time master's quest (laughs) (laughs) so it's like this it's like a lot more the same but like all you know a lot of elements rearranged and stuff like that and it feels very different um where more this one's more like majora's mask where it's like it's completely a new game Mm -hmm. but you might see like you know you might see link (laughs) <laughs> the same way you saw him before. Uh, but, you know, it, for the most part, it doesn't feel anything like the other game. Yeah. And I, that actually takes me to an interesting question that I want to ask you about, David. Obviously, it's been several years, probably been about 60 years since the Shovel Knight Kickstarter. And you guys, way back then, had the idea for these stretch goals to have these different campaigns for each of the knights. And way back then... <laughs> Did you have like an idea of what you wanted to, I guess, extrapolate or uh, redesign with the different knights? Or was that just kind of developed or iterated on over the course of Shovel Knight's uh, post-release work? Uh, Originally, the idea was we would create a... um you know, have, if you've ever played Mega Man Powered Up, where mm-hmm. you can play as the other bosses, it's, re- it's really more of a, yeah. you can play as the other character through the exact same content. Uh, the dialogue's changed like a little tiny bit, mm-hmm. but mostly it's the same. So that was that was really the initial inspiration for it. Mm-hmm. I mean, we were looking at games like that or like Castlevania 3, where you play through this different characters through the same content. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, once the Kickstarter did well and the game was doing well, uh, we just we were reevaluating that and just thought it felt sort of boring. <laughs> um, so we you know we wanted to go as big as we could and we wanted to do something that's different and hadn't been seen before. Uh, and that, and I mean that's where we landed with Plague Night. And then uh, after we finished Plague Night, it seemed you know we we got complaints like this is big, but I you know I wish I wasn't going through the same levels. So we we just went even bigger <laughs> with the next one. <laughs> yes, and. Um, right now, you, of course, have plans for a third expansion with um, King Knight, right? Or Royal Knight. Yeah, King Knight. That's right. 
Mm-hmm. I guess um, since there, it's still being worked on now, I, you know, I have to ask this. Or can you give us any like teasers or hints about how King Knight will play out com- differently compared to the other ones? Uh, I can't give anything away, <laughs> but I can say I I think it will be pretty surprising uh, <laughs> compared to what we've made so far. Yeah. Yep, and considering just that the jump from Shovel Knight to Plague Knight and now Plague Knight to Spectre Knight, I think that will certainly hold up when the time comes. I guess as <laughs> one quick uh, question about that, has there been any like loose dates for uh, King Knight or is it still up in the air at the moment? Uh, it's still up in the air. We're aiming to have it. I mean, we want to have everything out this year, uh, including the four player battle mode. That's our, that's our goal, but uh, we usually run light with these things. Yeah. <laughs> As I'm sure any of the other developers listening to this cast can attest to, there is no such thing as the perfect game development plan that everything goes perfectly the first time. There's never any bugs and everything just comes out exactly on time as you predicted. Yeah, well, maybe maybe at a AAA company where they got, <laughs> you know, they really got everything down to a science, but yeah. we're we're still uh, mm-hmm. exploring and 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 figuring out just how to make it pr- just the way we want. Mm-hmm. Now, one thing that um, I recently read that you guys put out was your discussions about the body swap or the gender options for Shovel Knight that are going to be. Is that in the game right now, or is that going to be added with the Spectre Knight update? Uh, that's added with the Spectre Knight update. So if you if you have it on the Switch, you mm-hmm. can get it right now. Uh, for the other systems, it'll be in April. Mm-hmm. And um, you did. I think you put up a piece about. Or I saw a Polygon article about how you guys approach. I guess redesigning all the different characters in terms of male and female variants. And um, if you wouldn't mind, David, for people listening to the cast who may not have who may have missed that article. What is the body swap update going to be about? Uh, so the body swap mode is uh, based on one of our stretch goals that we had called gender swap, mm-hmm. uh, which might give you a better idea, but we renamed it body swap. So mm-hmm. essentially in the original Shovel Knight campaign, Shovel of Hope, uh, you can you can change individually each character's body type and their text type. So if you wanted to have Shovel Knight uh, appear female in a female body type and you know, speak in a female voice, or if you wanted her to speak in a male voice uh, mm-hmm. with a female body or a male body with a female voice, uh, you could do that. And you can do that for all the main order of No Quarter Knights, Black Knight, Enchantress, and Shield Knight. Mm-hmm. Cool. And and from what you – from the Oracle, you guys definitely put a lot of thought into – how you want the different genders to look. It's not as simple as just the age-old example of just adding, you know, quote-unquote, the boob play to a character. <laughs> no, definitely. I mean, it took a lot. You know, just as, as when we created the original characters, we had to put mm-hmm. just as much thought and time uh, into creating those characters. But we had the, you know, the additional restrictions of... Uh, you know, building upon this existing character, uh, trying to figure out what that meant in terms of the gen, in terms of the you know gender spectrum, mm-hmm. uh, and making them work in terms of the gameplay too, because they have to make you you not not only do we have to make new designs, but we have to make designs that work 100% with the existing gameplay, mm-hmm. uh, making sure that all the hitboxes are the yeah. same, that the collision lines up. Uh, yeah, so it was ext- it was pretty v- a complicated process, uh, but it was a lot of fun. Mm-hmm. And I would love to talk more about that. That could certainly fill its own cast, especially in today's market, as there have been more discussions regarding uh, inclusivity when it comes to video games and game characters. Yeah, I mean, that, that that's definitely a big topic. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And I'm sure we start talking about that again. That's another hour onto this cast. Yeah, and for sure. um, so as we were just, as you just said, David, the body swap upgrade that is currently in the Switch version that will be due out with Spectre Knight. So obviously, I'm sure most of the people listening to this cast are probably on the PC side of things, so they haven't had a chance to look at Spectre Knight. So I guess my first question, I guess, regarding that is, or if you can talk about now, what have you guys done, or if you can even just tease it, what makes Spectre Knight different from the, from Plague Knight and Shovel Knight? Uh, So Spectre Knight really, I mean, if, 
if you if you played Plague Knight, you mm-hmm. you can see that it's you know it's a new story. It's Plague Knight going through Shovel Knight stages with some additions, some changes, uh, and a couple new boss fights. Specter Knight really is a whole new game. Uh, all the bosses have been redone. They have new attacks. All the music is new. Mm. All the level designs are new. Uh, I mean, you're going through the same theme stages, but they have new background art. They have new, every screen has been redesigned. Uh, you know, you go through a different, uh, you know, town or village, uh, whatever you want to call it. You get new weapons. You get new armors. Uh, you meet totally brand new characters. I mean, it's mm. really. Like, it's as close to a sequel you could have. And, you know, and, and I was saying the NES days, it probably would have been a sequel if you think about, like, one of those weird <laughs> sequels that were like, oh, this is, is nothing like the first game. <laughs> That's yeah. sort of what Shovel Knight is. Or, sorry, what Spectre of Torment is like. Uh, but, yeah, but the cool thing about Spectre Knight himself, he, I mean, he's very ninja-like uh, in his design. So he can, he latches onto walls and climbs up them and then can jump off them. Uh, and he also has his signature move is a dash slash. Mm-hmm. So when he's in the air and he's near an enemy, he will automatically target that enemy. And then if you hit the attack button, you'll slash towards them and fly <laughs> across the screen, uh, which is really a lot of fun. Cool. And one of the things, that, again, like going back to how you guys have really evolved this kind of game design over Shovel Knight to Plague the Spectre and again to King Knight is this idea that in the first Shovel Knight, the mechanics and such were heavily influenced by retro games. I mean, um, I think I did in one of my videos when I talked about Shovel Knight, I was talking about, okay, yeah, this is from DuckTales, or this section reminds me of Mega Man, or this is kind of like enemies from Castlevania and stuff like that. But then when we get to Plague Knight, it feels almost like an entirely original game. Like, I couldn't really piece together like any retro games that did something similar to what you guys did with Plague Knight. And it sounds like you're doing similar things with Spectre and then going forward with King Knight. Yeah, I mean, I think that's true. Like, you know, in all our game design, I think we're looking at all, we're looking at the entire, you know, and composite of all game history. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, you can say there's a lot of NES design in everything. I mean, if you even play Knight, like if you look at something like Rocket Knight, uh, I mean, that's like, it's very much like bouncing off the walls and going crazy and trying to and trying to like wrangle a uh, sort of like wild mobility into a 2D platformer, right? Mm-hmm. I, I would say that's like very similar to Plague Knight. I would say uh, Spectre Knight is really. Uh, I mean, he's still, you know, it's not it's not very similar to Batman NES, but you <laughs> you know, in Batman NES, you latch onto the walls and jump mm-hmm. off, and that's a really port- a key part of the gameplay. Or uh, Ninja Gaiden, you know, having these quick. Uh, very quick, short slashes, uh, and and cl- being able to climb walls again. Uh, I mean, it's like the same. We're we're definitely getting inspirations from those games, uh, and and we're always thinking about how to twist it or uh, what we can take away from it. I would say, you know, a big part of the mobility actually was mm-hmm. 3D Ninja Gaiden for mm. uh, Shovel Knight was uh, that was like the initial inspiration for how to make it cool. Like we were looking at moves like the flying swallow or, uh, mm-hmm. you know, just his, his, the way his wall climb mechanics work in, uh, the 3d ninja guidance. Cool. And it's even more amazing by the obvious fact that show Knight is this 2d game. Again, it looks like something, you know, that someone found on the nest, like a never released nest game, but <laughs> that kind of limitation is, does give some major advantages and disadvantages when you're trying to add in these new designs. Obviously, you are limited, which means that you have a pretty good idea of what you can and can't do with it. But at the same time, when you're basically working without a guide, it becomes that much more challenging to say, how do we create this brand new mechanic and fit it into this world that we've already created? Yeah, I mean, it's it's been it's definitely been a tricky process to take a you know, a game that was, uh, you know, Shovel Knight is mm-hmm. the core and take that kind of level structure and design and 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 add new uh, characters and mobility and story to it. Uh, uh, but I think that that territory probably comes with making any sequel to yeah. a game. And that's kind of interesting. You mentioned this a few minutes ago, David, regarding kind of the challenge you guys have been having with, I guess, branding these updates to Shovel Knight. Because as you said... 
if the first Plague Knight could be considered like, you know, like a mini expansion to Shovel Knight, Spectre Knight could be seen as, you know, an entirely original sequel. It just so happens to take place in the same world. And it's kind of tricky, especially in today's market, how things have really shifted in terms of expectations when it comes to, you know, DLC, new content, stuff like that. And... Like, from, like, your guys' perspective, again, you've been working on these kinds of video games for a long time, again, going back to the Way Forward era. Like, I guess, in terms of marketing show now, what you've been doing recently, how has things, I guess, shifted from that kind of market perspective? Uh, what do you mean shifted, I guess? <laughs> I guess in terms of, like, managing the expectations of, like, the consumer, letting them know that even though this is going to be, like, downloadable content for Shovel Knight, that this is really more of a sequel in terms of what you're, of what you're putting yeah, out. Yeah, I mean, I mean, we've tried to sort of pivot, so mm-hmm. we're, I mean, we're selling, now we're selling uh, Spectre of Torment separately uh, mm-hmm. in April and we release on all the platforms where we're going to release Shovel Knight and Plague of Shadows and mm-hmm. Spectre of Torment separately to try to like em- re-emphasize that these are totally uh, new games. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I think we're we're definitely still having a lot of trouble getting that message across. Uh, you know, I, I would say, uh, you know, to consumers and to media too. Uh, you know, it's I think it's hard for people to see that um, their new games until they really go through and play it. Uh, cause otherwise it looks very similar, right? It looks, it's still an NES game, uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> in, at it, at its core. So, uh, I think what they see is, Oh, this just looks like a normal expansion, you know, and the expansions you, that you typically play aren't that exciting, right? They aren't usually mm-hmm. new games. Um, so yeah, I mean, we're, we're still working on how, how to convince people that these, these really are much bigger and better than you, you think they are. Mm -hmm. And again, that has certainly been a challenge facing a whole lot of different parts of the game industry these days in terms of that marketing, especially when it comes to independent studios. And again, that's easily another 40, 15 minute topic you can jump on to. Now, yeah, one, it's definitely always tricky to get your voice heard. <laughs> definitely. And uh, for someone like me, I can really, really attest to that with everything that's been going on since we last spoke. But I guess here is a, a question I wanted to ask you about, David. Um, when we looked at when you guys worked on Plague Knight, one of the things that you added into that was the challenge mode. And again, for those of you who didn't play Plague Knight, there was basically a series of standalone ep- levels that challenge you with like different and unusual tasks, like either getting through levels with a specific item or boss rush under time constraints, stuff like that. With the upcoming Spectre Knight for the PC, are there any like new modes or new, I guess, side content that you're planning on adding in? Uh, yeah, so there we're adding. Uh, there's five more Plague Knight challenges. Uh, so to bring his uh, the stages up to ten, uh, uh, you know, not at, not counting the boss challenges, mm-hmm. uh, and then where you also have uh, five Specter Knight stage challenges and and uh, boss challenges for Specter Knight's campaign, and we have a sound test mode. Uh, so <laughs> you know, before you could talk to the Bard or Oolong in Plague of Shadows and Shovel Knight to like listen to the music but we decided just to add a whole separate menu where you can go and play any track from any of the different uh games cool and the challenge modes were very interesting when i play them it certainly took me a while to get my head around the time constraints when you fall all the bosses over (laughs) again i guess um since i don't think we spoke since like both i think we spoke before plague knight was released my next question for you, David, is how did you and the rest of Yacht Club, I guess, approach designing these standalone challenges? Uh, yeah, I mean, we for the bosses, it was really like, how can we uh, create a scenario that makes it interesting for you? Either we, mm-hmm. we put a weapon in your hands that you didn't think about how it could be useful, or, mm-hmm. you know, we make you do it with low health, just so you're really pushing yourself. Um uh, that kind of thing, just trying to make you rethink about those battles. Mm-hmm. Uh, and for the stages, it was really, I mean, it was just our opportunity to just go a little tougher on you. Because, mm-hmm. uh, you know, in the game, we try to keep it uh, pretty light and easy, and uh, at least not in terms of 
I'm doing this over and over and over again. And since we, you know, since you have that retry button in challenge mode, we can sort of push the limits a little bit more. Mm -hmm. uh, and just because it's a little more bite sized, right? Yeah, definitely. I think I think there were a few that drove me crazy when I played. I mean, there was <laughs> one that you had to like avoid damage for I think sixty seconds. I think that uh, one was. Oh my god, I was pulling my hair out a few times with that one. I'm sorry. <laughs> but no, it was very interesting, and it's a great way of expanding the game without, of course, you know, having to completely add in new levels or new stuff along those lines. Yeah, I mean, the fun thing about challenge mode is we can do discrete, uh, yeah. you know, puzzles or combat challenge scenarios, that kind of thing. Uh, and not have to worry about connecting it to this whole huge yeah. uh, piece. And that, I mean, that's really a lot of the challenge with the level design is, you know, you have this, mm -hmm. you, designing a screen on its own can be mm -hmm. uh, actually a lot easier than designing, designing a screen as part of this, a part of a 32 mm -hmm. screen stage as part of it, part of is a, yeah. a, you know, a 12 <laughs> course, you know, th yeah. thing. Uh, you got, you don't have to think about all those things when you're just doing a, a tiny challenge. Mm-hmm. Oh, I think with that, we can probably move on to our second big topic, which is talking more about modern retro design. But I have one more, I guess, Shovel Knight related question for you, David. And I'm not sure if you've thought about this one yet. So this could either be a really short or really <laughs> long answer. But here All we right. go. Um, obviously, as we've said, uh, Spectre Knight's going to be due out for the other platforms in April. And you're hoping to have King Knight and the four player mode done by the end of the year. And my question for you is, have you guys thought about, I guess, what's next for Yacht Club? Do you think you'll stick with, like, Shovel Knight? Like, will we see a Shovel Knight 2? Or have you thought about something, you know, completely entirely different, like, going forward once this is all wrapped up? Uh, I mean, we've thought about it all, I would say. <laughs> I would yeah. say there's, nothing, there's definitely nothing off the table. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, we... We really want to continue the Shovel Knight series. I mean, we're very attached to it. We built it. We wanted it to be a game that was a franchise, not just a one game standoff. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, we'd love to make that. I think the team might be a little burned out on <laughs> Shovel Knight at this point because we've been making it for four years now. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> so I wouldn't, I wouldn't be surprised if the next project we went to uh, wasn't that. Uh, mm -hmm. but who knows we'll see uh, we i mean we're we are hoping to begin a new game very soon so we'll see what t takes hold yeah and i guess as i guess a side question from that do you see like your team still working with this uh, with again like the pixel style graphics going forward or do you think that will kind of stay with shovel knight and you'll experiment with something else with whatever your next project may be. Uh, I think I think we want to go all over the map. So mm -hmm. I think we would want to make, you know, I, I, I think the team is really dynamic a 3D game. <laughs> <laughs> so I think that's one of the things we're trying to aim towards. And at the same time, I we really do like making, you know, pixel art style games because it just affords you so much ability to yeah. make rapid uh, gameplay and really pack it in. Uh, and we, we really enjoy that development style so I, I can see us doing that again for sure cool all right so i think with that we'll move on to our final talk for tonight and for those of you listening we're going to try to keep this at an hour again the last time i think david and i spoke we like hit like two maybe two and a half hours so <laughs> uh, since then we've gotten at least a little bit better with keeping to a schedule but again you never know and especially with this next topic we'll kind of see how long we can talk about it but our topic is going to be this, as I said at the start, this quote-unquote modern retro movement we've been seeing. Now, you guys released Shovel Knight, I believe that was in 2014, is that right? I'm sorry, we what in 2014? Did sorry. you release Shovel Knight in 2014? Was that the original uh, release? Yeah, that's right, June, June of 2014 was when it all, first came out. All those decades ago for yes. us right now. <laughs> and. And, of course, you guys did the Kickstarter for, I think, a year or two before then. And as we've seen, especially over the last four or five years, that this idea of, as I said, modern retro, designing games either looking like, like classic NES, NES titles or featuring classic designs, either elevated or original, but it's still in that same theme, have certainly grown in popularity. Uh, from my own experience, I've been playing games like 
All Was Awakening, Odalis the Dark Hole. As I said before, the cast Axiom Verge is another good one. And I am sure there are plenty, plenty more of those out there. And that kind of design sensibility is it fascinates me in terms of trying to bounce the old with the new. And one of the reasons why I wanted to talk to you again, David, obviously with Shovel Knight, is the fact that you guys have certainly been working on that balance between trying to make a game that looks and feels like something out of the Ness era without all the annoyances or the things that drove people <laughs> crazy back in the day. So I guess to get the ball rolling for this part of our cast, my first question for you is, again, you guys have certainly had experience with 2D design and 2D philosophy. How did you approach, I guess, Shovel Knight from a design point of view? Again, as you said, looking at these older games and going, we want to make a game like this, but we want to avoid so-and-so in terms of, you know, trying to keep down the frustration factor. Yeah, I mean, uh, for us, we, I mean, we really just wanted to capture the fun that we found in those games. Uh, I mean, so we were looking at games like Zelda 2 and Mega Man and Mario and, you know, Castlevania, uh, you know, really all those classic games and saying uh, at every point, what is, what is fun? Like, what do we enjoy in this game? What are we trying to capture out of it? What do we, what do we want to take away? What's the feeling we're trying to get, right? It didn't really matter. We're not, you know, it's not the art. It's not the, uh, music. It's not the, uh, the you know second by second gameplay per se is really like what is that feeling that you get out of it like what are the what's the like the core tenant to it that makes it different than the games that we're playing today i mean that's really what we wanted to to get across that there was something in those games that was special that we that was missing um so that's i mean that's what we're going over and then i mean from there it's just it was just making, you know, making the best game yeah. we could using all the knowledge we could, <laughs> right? Mm-hmm. It didn't really matter if the, you know, if, if it was a modern game like Dark Souls that we were looking at, or if it was an old game like Zelda Two. Uh, you know, we wanted to go after the best idea and get that in the game. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I guess going with that about looking at trying to make the best version of this game. That was one of the things, again, that really stood out for all, for Shovel Knight and, again, for some of these other examples I've been playing is that they do feel, while they still look and feel like something from 1998, I'm sorry, 1989, 1990, that kind of thing, they're still very much their own unique property. In, a few minutes ago, I talked about how when I was going through Shovel Knight, I was basically you know picking out the references. This is from DuckTales. This is from Mega Man, so on. But... At the end of the day, it still came together as something entirely original or entirely Shovel Knight. Yeah, I mean, we we were very intentional about making it mm-hmm. its own experience. You know, we didn't have any references to other, you know, we didn't have any direct references to other mm-hmm. games. You know, we didn't quote, you know, take this uh, sword, or, you know, uh, what does he say? I forgot what he says now. <laughs> Uh, you know, it's okay. Go alone or whatever at the top yeah. the beginning of Zelda. We didn't, we didn't have any direct <laughs> quotes. We didn't have any mm-hmm. direct gameplay or just ideas that we took. Uh, we, we tried to be very specific mm-hmm. that, uh, and only doing things that made sense for the game we were making. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so there's a down thrust in Shovel Knight, which is inspired from the Zelda two down thrust. Uh, but you know, they work nothing like each other. The Zelda two one isn't really used for mobility at all. It's like strictly combat. Right. Uh, and, and we actually landed in a place that was somewhat similar to DuckTales, but still is very far, right? And DuckTales, yeah. you can bounce off anything. Uh, mm-hmm. there's not really, you can, you can stop your bounce at any time. Uh, mm-hmm. and you know, we, we created a, me- a Mega Man like stage structure, uh, but at the same time, you don't really explore it that much in Mega Man, at least the, mm-hmm. the classic series. Yeah. Uh, you, you don't, uh, you, you know, we didn't, we didn't do things like, Oh, you get the weapon at the end of the stage. Like we tried to stay away from those hallmarks mm-hmm. and make, make it be its own experience through and through. Cause the, and, and the end, that's what we think makes a good franchise and yeah. what makes a good game. Definitely. And one thing that I was curious about, like, talking about these kinds of modern retro games is kind of how the audience has taken to them 
as we've seen over the last few years, this kind of market for these older, for these games that look and feel like older titles has certainly grown. And I'm just wondering if you guys have had a chance to talk to your audience or looked at like the numbers. Like, in terms of like the market who's been enjoying Show and Light, has it been like more like younger gamers, people who didn't grow up with these older titles? Or have you gotten a lot of support from older fans, you know, people like me who grew up with games like right. Castlevania, Mega Man, etc.? I, I don't know. We don't we don't really get numbers on that kind mm-hmm. of thing. We don't have breakdowns uh, from the online uh, sellers that, mm-hmm. t- that tells us, you know, 50% of your audience is under 10 or anything like <laughs> that. Uh, I mean, the best feedback we get is usually at conventions, and I would say that the Spectrum at conventions is all over the place, but, you know, in general, conventions are attended by uh, 20 to 30 year olds uh, or so. Um, so, yeah, I would I would guess that it leans towards uh, being older, uh, just because that makes sense the people with wallets <laughs> that are purchasing what they want um but i think th- in general it's it doesn't it doesn't seem like it's that limited uh to that audience mm-hmm. and, and that's kind of what we were seeing with stuff like from gog and how there certainly is a wide spectrum of fans who are looking at these classic games either people who grew up with them or those who never had a chance to play them and kind of want to see what all the fuss is about and yeah. as you said with Shovel Knight, while it does look like an older game, it definitely features a lot of inspiration from modern titles. Again, there's no live systems, there's no password, stuff like that. It's just a really good game that stands on its own. But again, it just so happens to look like something that we could have played back in the NES era. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we were we were making a, you know, we wanted to make a modern game, uh, but something that made it clear that if you like Shovel Knight, here's the kind of games that were that you should look to next. You know, mm-hmm. um, you know, we did, if we made it look gorgeous, beautiful, uh, totally modern art, you might not realize that this came from, you know, the history of this game came yeah. from these old titles, and that's and that's. I mean, when a when an, a ten year old comes and plays our game, it's a, it's very exciting to us that we can say, "Oh, you you should try out Mega Man after this," because mm-hmm. you'll like it because you you know you like this game, so that they're very similar in some in some regards, and you'll you'll be able to make that connection. Whereas you know they might have jumped into a Mega Man before they played Shovel Knight, and mm-hmm. it just didn't work for them, right? Because yeah. they didn't have the you know the yeah. things you need to realize what that game that that game is fun because uh, mm-hmm. you're you're too used to modern conventions, right? Yeah, and that's a really good point there, David, about kind of like modern conventions versus the older ones. And when we look at this kind of modern retro genre, you can see a very wide berth in terms of how they present challenge and difficulty. I just remember another one I recently played, uh, Curse Castalia, which was kind of like a ghouls and ghosts uh, right. spiritual successor. And as you said, these games have their own unique quirks to it. Like, for instance, with Curse, there is a live system. You can run out of lives and get to a continue screen. While something like Always Awakening, you die anywhere, you're back at wherever you last saved. You know, there's no lives, there's no checkpoint, that kind of thing. Right. And... It's always a challenge, I think, with balancing, the, again, these older and modern conventions. As you said with Shovel Knight, it could have been very easy to throw in a live system and say, you run out of lives and level, you go back to the start. But that would, again, be looking more towards older conventions instead of the modern ones. Uh, y- yeah, I don't, I don't know if I necessarily agree with that. I mean, I think, uh, at least based on for lives, I don't, I don't think live, I mean, lives is an older convention for, yeah. I guess for sure. Um, but I wouldn't, I don't know. There's, there's a extent to which we chose that we, we didn't choose lives because it was an old convention. Uh, I mean, we didn't choose to not include it. I mean, we didn't include lives because it didn't make sense with the gameplay we were creating. Mm -hmm. Um, but I think we could make a game with lives and show how it could work in a modern context too, if we really wanted to. (laughs) Mm -hmm. And that would be very interesting. Again, we're certainly seeing a lot of developers today look to the past in terms of, either elevating older designs or trying to figure out a new way or a new interpretation of these older systems. Yeah, I think, I mean, I think that's really cool too. Uh, you know, there's a lot of brilliant 
uh, ideas and designs that came in those old games and it's and I wouldn't want to see them go if I'm you know and it's 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 good that people are still trying to include them and make them relevant today mm-hmm. now one other part that I want to talk about especially this kind of modern retro is I'm sure this is a part that you guys have certainly had some challenge with with Shovel Knight is again the difficulty factor as we said a lot of these older games we're certainly on the harder side, and this is kind of one of those weird things, because when we think of kids' games today, we think of stuff like, you know, the Lego games, um, the stuff from Traveler's Tales, games that are meant to be played for, like, a very young audience, nothing too challenging. But when we grew up playing these older games, we got stuff like Contra, like Castlevania, (laughs) um... Ninja Guide N, and so many death traps and pits that you can imagine. So... When you're trying to design a game like that, and again, going back to this balance of old and new, how did you guys approach things from a difficulty point of view? Because playing through Show Night, from for the most part, it felt like a very progressively growing difficulty curve. Like nothing seemed like one part was just like all of a sudden like a brick wall of difficulty, and then you get to the end, you certainly face some very interesting challenges. Uh, yeah, I mean, we, I mean, that was the definitely the bane of our existence and still is to this day uh making a game that is uh can appeal to as many players as possible whether you're jumping into it for the first time or you're an experienced person uh, is really really hard to do and and for us it's really hard to see uh because we're you know incredibly good at our games not to (laughs) brag (laughs) but you know when you play it every day yeah uh you get really good at it uh and you get uh, sort of blinded to the ways that it is difficult. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so I mean, a lot of our design decisions just came around trying to f- provide options to the player. Um, mm-hmm. So if you're, you know, if you get hit a lot, then you have the phase locket to help you avoid damage. Uh, if you're scared to run up to enemies, then you have uh, the flare wand to attack from afar. Um, mm-hmm. You know, if you find the game way too easy, you can break the checkpoints. Uh, if you find the game way too hard, you can add a cheat code that makes you invulnerable and jump really high. Uh, so we just we tried to add as many avenues for anyone to get into the game as possible while still having the same core experience. Mm-hmm. And again, it's always about trying to figure out just exactly the skill level of the people that are going to play your game. As you said a few minutes ago, that was like a very nice thing about, like you have like 10 year olds playing Shovel Knight for the first time who are enjoying this, who have never touched like Castlevania or the original Mario. They've never had to go through something like um, Castlevania three with all those crazy jumps and stuff like that. Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, you, you know, the play, a player might be going into it only have been been playing Wii games, right? They mm-hmm. might be used to motion controls only. Uh, they might have never picked up a controller before, and so thinking through all of that, um, how to teach those players, how to not handhold uh, the people that are experienced, uh, is mm-hmm. definitely a tricky balance. Yep, definitely. And as you said, this is all. This is not just a problem with like uh, making like a modern retro game, but this is always something even with any game developed today, there's always that risk of you basically going to blinders mode, thinking that your game is fine, perfect, everyone's going to love it, and then you release it and everyone goes like, this is horrible, how did you design it like this, and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. We, I mean, we do a lot of playtesting uh, with friends and uh, out, outsiders as much as possible to, to just make, to keep that experience fresh in our minds, that what, it, what it's like to play it for the first time. Mm-hmm. Yep, and it's always interesting, again, like trying to build these games up along that line. When you're trying to design something for someone who has never touched these games while still providing challenge, again, for people like us who grew up playing these games or at least have that background in video games to say, you know, the first little show, like, yeah, I can get through this no problem. You know, you know, why is this in there? I can just beat this with my eyes closed kind of thing. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's where... You know, even if we make it easy, it's mm-hmm. you. There's still ways to make it interesting, yes. right? Uh, and that's 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 always what we're pushing towards. Mm-hmm. And with a game like Shell Knight, again with this modern retro movement, we can really see how developers such as yourself 
are trying or or succeeding in taking these things further than they were back in the day. As I said a few minutes ago with the example of Axiom Verge, yes, it looks like a game, it does look like a Metroid-style game, but when you start digging into it, it is entirely original in its design and what they wanted to develop in terms of storytelling. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's pretty cool that the different directions people are taking, you know, these old ideas, and uh, it's cool to see what they do with them. Mm -hmm. Now, here's a question I'm not sure if you'll be able to answer this one, but it's one that I've been generally curious about. As we've said, with this modern retro, another major part of this is obviously the aesthetics. And one thing that I have certainly learned over the course of the last few years with talking to developers and seeing all these different games, is that there is certainly a difference between, I guess, quote-unquote, okay pixel art and good or great pixel art. (laughs) And I'm sure you have certainly have had discussions like that. I'm sure there's been people in the forum talking about it as well. I guess my question is, when you're designing like games like this, again, with this older aesthetic and look, for the people listening, what kind of work goes into things from like the art point of view? And again, this could easily be a 30, 40 minute question if we let it. Yeah, I mean, from our point of view, we develop it the same way. So, uh, you know, when we design anything that goes into the game, any art endeavor, it first gets con- con- a concept art piece of concept art made, whether that's a tiny sketch or it's a full fleshed out drawing. Um of any character or any environment, uh, then then we go to in the next stage, which is uh, taking that concept to more of an illustration. Mm-hmm. Uh, so f- like fleshing it out, getting it more of an idea. Uh, from there, uh, once it's like a little more, you know, here are the colors, here are the uh, general like body shape and stuff. Then it will go to then it will start to form in the uh, in game look. Right, which in, in our case is pixel art. So uh, we'll have an artist do a pixel art version of it, and then you know, based on you know changes that might have been made for the pixel art uh, or adjustments or figuring you know maybe in drawing it for the pixel art and trying to adapt it for the game purpose, you realize oh he really needs a gun on his shoulder or whatever. Uh, then then you know those changes are made and it goes back to the illustration. Uh, the illustration gets finalized, that gets done, then the pixel art gets made from that finalized illustration, and then you're done with a piece of art. And then from there, uh, you know, it's animating it, it's doing all the stuff you need to actually make it work in the game. Uh, and, I mean, that that process is the same as when we'd make a very fancy piece of art that goes in the game, or, you know, if we had mm-hmm. HD art or if we had pixel art. Yeah. And I, I would say, like, the big challenge, the big difference is, with pixel art is um, you have to do a lot of work to make sure it's it's extremely readable. It's usually, uh, mm-hmm. you know, it's a big challenge because you're working with so few colors and so few pixels that you need to make it uh, the silhouette stand out and yes, make it definitely. pop out from the background and uh, make it clear, like, what is damageable, what is not damageable, mm-hmm. uh, you know where where you know, the different like attacks might come from. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, there's a lot that goes into just making it readable. I mean, you can the, even even with the best pixel art, there's a lot mm-hmm. of. I mean, like Agamemnon from is that how you say it? Uh, from like Link to the Past is like a classic example of like mm-hmm. people don't know where the don't know where his face is <laughs> on the yeah. sprite because it's just it's just hard to tell because uh, yeah. you can. If you look at it, there's like two ways to see it. And that's, I mean, that happens with the, a lot of the best pixel art. And mm-hmm. so just trying to eliminate those kind of factors is a big challenge. Definitely. And I can certainly attest to that one about having, being able to actually see your character on the screen. Because especially with a lot of games I've seen over the last few years, there have been plenty of examples of the character just blending so well in the background that it becomes almost impossible to keep your focus on them. And I've had those games where I, I'm getting hit by things. I'm like, why am I getting hit? And I'm like, wait, where's my character? Like, there's so much That's stuff so happening on the screen that it just, you know, disappears into the chaos of what's going on. Yeah, it's definitely a big – I mean, it's a big problem in games in general just to mm-hmm. uh, separate out those elements so it's all understandable. Mm-hmm. 
Now, one other part about uh, modern retro, even just a uh, retro game design that I want to touch on, is kind of like the difference in terms of enemy behavior. One of the things that we've seen, especially with a lot of modern games, is you have an AI that can usually adapt or can or have like different patterns or be able to challenge the player by not presenting the same thing each time. But when we look at a lot of older games, they are very much built on pattern recognition. Or you know that if the enemy uh, lifts his arms up, he'll perform this attack. If he does two jumps over you, he'll perform this attack. And it's kind of like one of like those big divides between older and more modern designs in terms of presenting these effective challenges. Now, with Shovel Knight, I guess, how did you guys go about, I guess, designing the bosses in a way to challenge the player without it being, like, you know, completely over the top, like trying to beat Mega Man without using any of, like, the special weapon weaknesses kind of thing? Yeah, I mean, with our boss designs, we sort of try to do a mix, so... Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we, we build them with patterns, with specific mm -hmm. patterns in mind uh, often, but we tried to make those patterns be looser mm -hmm. uh, or more random or choose in the patterns in a way that make them less clear what the patterns are. Um, so if you look at someone like Play Knight's boss fight, uh, he's extremely patterned, even though he gives the illusion that he's not. So he mm -hmm. he always does one, two, or three jumps, and then he throws the bomb, and mm -hmm. he always throws the bomb right at your feet every single time, uh, and that mm -hmm. that's it. But you know, because we lay him out in a pattern that those those the number of times he jumps is random, uh, and mm -hmm. And that there are blocks that he's just throwing under you and that you are – and then he's throwing the, the bomb at you, right? So you mm -hmm. you are controlling the randomness by where you're yeah. moving, uh, that it feels very chaotic and messy. Uh, and the collision is going to be different every time you fight him depending on where you're standing and where he's throwing those bombs. Um, so it was – like to us, it was a lot of uh, how do we integrate th like both the best of both worlds mm -hmm. uh, in that matter. Uh, and I would say sometimes, you know, sometimes we're extremely patterned. Like if you think of something like uh, the beginning of Polar Knight or Enchantress's fight, uh, they often begin with very, very patterned attacks. And, and that way we can teach you, oh, when you th when, you know, when Polar Knight throws a snowball, I can bounce off the snowball and that makes it easier. Right. Once you learn that element, then we go to the more chaotic stuff afterwards. Mm hmm. Definitely. And. Uh, keeping with that, in terms of teaching the player, uh, we've talked about this multiple times on the cast. I may post about this, that kind of organic tutorial design, where you're teaching the player through playing the game, as opposed to uh, the old ways, or what we see in modern games, with everything just stops for a tutorial. You know, you're walking around, all of a sudden you'll get a dialogue box pops up that tells you exactly what to do. And... One of the things about a lot of old school design, especially with this modern retro movement, has been figuring out how to integrate the tutorial or the learning part of the game into the level design. And with Shovel Knight, I think you guys did a really good job on that front in terms of uh, presenting things in a way that first you get the basic, then you get the advance, and then you get, you know, the expert, you know, navigate through a death trap using this item or system. Yeah, I mean, we we spend a lot of time uh, trying to make sure each element is taught to you and not only taught to you, but like retaught to you a hundred times so you can't forget it. Uh, and, and, and doing that in a way that, you know, is transparent and fun and uh, isn't in your face in any way. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I think that's part of... Um, I don't know, making a game be quick and breezy to get mm -hmm. through is doing that. And a lot of times the hand-holding tutorials make it feel like it's a long time till you actually get to start the game. Uh, and mm -hmm. we thought one of, the mo one of the most fun things about NES games is you can go, you just, you turn it on and you're in it immediately, right? Mm -hmm. 
definitely. <laughs> of course, no tutorials for a game like Mario. <laughs> there, you just go right. Yeah, and I would say, I mean, those tutorials. I, I think a lot of people often talk about this, the first level of a game, right? Yes. But I mean, we think about those in every single screen mm-hmm. of the game in total, including mm-hmm. the boss fights, right? Yeah. Including, including getting the weapons, including, uh, mm-hmm. you know, every single element that you ever encounter. We have to teach to you. Definitely. Uh, uh, in a way that's like safe and mm-hmm. like and lets you learn it uh and and uh and hopefully it's fun <laughs> mm-hmm. yep and i think we just said there that it was a good uh, case in point with the items every item in shovel knight has its own little section that you get the item and then you have to use that item to basically get yourself out of that section and yeah. that's a good way again of teaching the player organically okay here's the item here's what it does Here's what you can use it for, and now go. And then when you get later into the game, there's those advanced challenges. I think there's like those bonus, uh, those side content areas where now you have to master the phase locket or right. master. I think was it the knuckle dusters, the uh, 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 the dust punch- knuckles, yeah, dust knuckles, yeah. <laughs> but and again, as you said, it's all about presenting this in a way that the player should be learning this as they go along if you do your job right. Yeah, yeah, and just and providing the opportunity for players yeah. to learn it uh, mm-hmm. is, I mean, is also a big piece. Like sometimes, uh, it can be very hard to get the nuances of a cool weapon, right? Like, mm-hmm. um, I'm trying to think of an example. Like, for example, in the Specter of Torment campaign, you get the uh, the Death Claw, which <laughs> is a big, huge attack that can break through shields. Right. And when you read the description and you use it, you might not realize, oh, it also moves you slightly horizontally when you use it. Mm -hmm. Um, So you can cross a gap easier. But you might have not known that unless we present a case and where where you where you like can't make it over a larger gap. Right. Mm -hmm. Uh, So just being able to see those elements is something we have to like provide the opportunity for. Yeah. And then there's always that challenge, of course, of presenting enough for the player to figure things out, but again, not bogging them down by having like five, ten different screens of basic use of this item. <laughs> right. <laughs> now, uh, we, I know we're approaching the hour. I'm sure you have to get going in a few minutes. So we'll begin to wrap things up. And there is, I guess, a few more questions I have for you regarding like this kind of modern retro. And this is one that I definitely want to touch on. As we've talked about, with designing a game with the older styles, especially with something like Shovel Knight, you are uh, working with an audience of all ages. As we've said, you have people who have never touched a NES game in their lives, and then you have people who have grown up, they've mastered all the Mega Mans, all the Castlevanias, etc. And one of the more interesting challenges, as we've said, is about, a, I guess presenting a progressively growing difficulty curve. Again, easy, medium, hard, as we're all well aware of. My question for you, David, it comes about when it comes to the expert side. As you know, in Shovel Knight, the final area is the Enchantress's Castle, and that's a multi-stage part, basically hitting the player with the most advanced stuff that you can come up with. And when it comes to designing a game like that, how did you guys, I guess, balance things from the expert point of view because obviously when you're dealing with players who have mastered everything before it you can hit them with almost anything that you can think of uh some of my favorite examples is from uh the mario galaxy games when we talk about the post game worlds or the post game courses when nintendo just basically says you want difficulty you know here try all this yeah so how did you guys, I guess, try to balance things out at the end when you know that the player has already gone through everything without, of course, just making it like a torture of the final three levels? Yeah, I mean, part of it is, you know, keeping a solid ramp up, right? Even for all players. So, I mean, you start off and it's pretty easy and by the end it's very hard, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and in between it's a solid increase to that, that stand to that point. Um, I mean, that was a big component of it. I would say, uh, another component is that it gets harder, but you have more options to make it easier, right? You have more weapons, you have more armors, you, you find the flaws in your own playing and you're able to make up for them. Uh, 
And then, you know, p- past that, it's, you know, we provide if you if you never if it's always too easy, right, then you can go into New Game Plus and you can try that out or you can try challenge stages um, mm-hmm. or you can try to look for every secret. You, you can make it harder. You can break the checkpoints. Uh, you can find ways to make it fit your needs. Right. Mm hmm. And that kind of self-improvement is such a key part, not just of retro games, but of course, of just game development or game design in general. You never want the player to feel like they're wasting their time, but at the in the same breath, you can't just, as we've said, throw the player into the thick of it and say, okay, learn all these new mechanics while you're fighting death traps and ultimate bosses. <laughs> well, I mean, you can. That's, a, yeah, that's one style can. of game. <laughs> you can, but uh, there's going to be a whole lot of people going, what the hell just happened here? It was all nice, and now I'm dying 80 times of this one fight. Yeah. All uh, right. I think we'll begin to wrap things up here. And again, um, for those of you listening, we could easily segue into who knows how many different topics. But my final question, I guess, for you, for you, David, for tonight regarding this kind of modern retro is, as we've said, this kind of uh, – style has certainly exploded over the last four or five years. Again, just about the time that Shovel Knight was released, and especially during the Kickstarter development. I guess in your opinion, I'm, again, this may be too tough of an answer just for you to answer, but I'm just wondering, do you think that this will go away? I know this kind of let, goes back into the discussion of if video games are art, and you know, if we start talking about that, that's easily another hour. But when it comes to these kinds of styles, in most other entertainment industries, you know, the new will make the old obsolete. Once we go from – once there's color TV, there's no need for black and white. And for a lot of people, they kind of feel like this kind of old school design or this kind of 2D look doesn't hold up. Or, you know, why should I go back to these games when I can just play whatever the latest, you know, high-def modern game? So my question for you is, do you think that this will continue? Do you think we'll still see developers embrace this kind of older design or this older philosophy for today's market? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, I think it will go in ebbs and flows. Uh, mm-hmm. I think, you know, a, cu- a couple of years ago uh, you know, that uh, when 3D games were really kicking and hot, uh, you, could, you could barely find a 2D game and they wouldn't sell and no one cared. Mm-hmm. Uh, and now 2D games are doing pretty well. Uh, and I think in a few years, 2D games will probably be doing pretty poorly again. And, <laughs> you know, in 10 years, they'll be doing great. Uh, and, I, and I think... Um, you know, to compare it to other markets, I think you're sort of not right about that, actually. Uh, you know, I think you're right in some ways. Like, mm-hmm. uh, f- you know, uh, f- a black and white movie isn't nearly as popular as it used to be, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but, uh, you know, they still make them and they, and they still sell when there's a really good one, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and, you know, uh, I, I would say, like, the general uh, uh, looking back uh, does fairly well, right? Like, um, superhero movies are a big thing right now, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and that that wasn't true for the night, you know, for much yeah. of the '90s and the and the big, uh, you know, they were really popular in the '80s, and we just sort of skipped 20 years, and yeah. now they're popular again. And I think there'll probably be a time when they won't be. Uh, I mean, if you look at like TV, like Stranger Things was the biggest TV show last year, right? And that's, I mean, that's based on '80s like 80s all the way right Mm -hmm. um so i think i think there's a natural tendency to look back and try to improve and incorporate those ideas uh and but that said it's not gonna it's not gonna be the main thing everyone's looking at Mm -hmm. uh it's it's always i think it'll always be uh you know one that that one that fun five percent of the the 95 or the 100 percent things you're looking at Mm -hmm. yep I think that's a great point, David. I think that's a good one to end on. I think I agree with you about that. Like As we've seen, I mean, the survival horror genre is another example of that. There was a time that everyone said survival horror is dead. You know, I remember famously that one of the producers at Resident Evil said, you know, survival horror is no longer viable anymore. 
And then we saw how things have certainly changed with from the independent space. And then very recently, we have Resident Evil 7 back on the market. So there's always those peaks and valleys. And Yeah, and I, think it, I think it's just like people get exhausted of things, yeah. right? Uh, mm-hmm. They just can't take it, you know, and once they have that, like, fresh break from it, then they're, then they're itching for it again. <laughs> mm-hmm, definitely. So I think with that again, we can if you if you have the next three four hours open, we could certainly sit here and talk. But I'm sure you have to get going. And again, I don't want to delay Spectre. And I don't want to be the guy who puts <laughs> that on delay for the PC. So we'll end things here to wrap things up. I guess for your night, then just to reiterate for the folks listening. When is Specter Knight's campaign going to be out for, like, the PC or off of the Switch? Uh, yeah, so, yeah, Nintendo Switch is out now, but the rest of the platforms, PC, Xbox One, PS3, PS4, uh, Vita, 3DS, Wii U, uh, Amazon Fire, some <laughs> other ones I probably forgot, are we're aiming for early April. That's that's our goal. We're, I mean, we're going through the submission process with all our partners right now, and we're mm-hmm. squashing bugs and trying to make them perfect. So, uh, yeah, look forward to those coming soon. Cool. And uh, talking about the bug squashing and the cross-platforming, this is just a quick tangent, but it's something I was just curious about. When you're porting, when when you're doing the porting of Shovel Knight to the other platforms, is uh, Yacht Club basically handling all that in-house, or is that being done like through third-party studios? So I know some developers sometimes outsource cross-platform work. Uh, so we've done a little bit of outsourcing mm-hmm. with with people we know, like just mm-hmm. I mean, just contractors really. Uh, but I would say for the most part, it's almost all done in-house. Cool. All right. And then my last question is one that I need to ask as an Amiibo fan. Are we going to see any more, I guess, Shovel Knight related Amiibos going forward? Oh, I don't know. Uh, maybe it's possible. There's <laughs> definitely more Amiibo, Amiibo, Amiibo content in this uh, in the new update. So look forward to that. Yeah, I need to get a Shovel Knight for my collection because I have all the Nintendo characters staring at me. And I'm sure Shovel Knight would fit right no, along. You definitely got to get a Shovel Knight. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So I think with that, we will wrap things up. Again, David, it has been a pleasure hanging out with you. Hopefully, it won't be 60 years until we talk (laughs) again next. All right. Thanks for having me. No problem. And again, uh, definitely congratulations to you and the rest of Yacht Club with Shell Knight success. Like I said, I can't wait to play Spectre Knight and... Whatever you guys come up with next, I'm sure I will be chomping at the bit to check out. <laughs> oh, thank you. We, we hope everyone enjoys uh, Spectre Torment. Awesome. So for those of you listening, we are going to end things here for tonight. Thank you so much for listening. Like we said, be sure to check out Spectre Night in early April, as well as whatever comes next from Yacht Club. As, you, as we were talking about, the next expansion will be the King Knight one, which at this point will hopefully be out by the end of 2017. But as we've certainly talked about, you never know the specifics when it comes to game development. Um, as always, if you enjoy the cast, there are several ways to support or follow Game Wisdom. If you'd like to write a guest piece for the site or be a future guest for any of our recording or live discussions, you can find information and links under Submissions Wanted. Be sure to check out the Game Wisdom YouTube channel, now over 1,000 subscribers, for daily videos on game design, looks at video games, and more. You can follow us on Twitch and Twitter under GW Bicer for the latest updates, as well as live streams. And last but not least, be sure to check us out on Patreon under Game Wisdom or GW Bicer. Your donations can help us keep going and growing. As we hit our goals, it will mean unlocking more content for everyone to enjoy. So again, David, thank you so much for coming on for tonight. And like I said, I'll be looking forward to Spectre Night, and hopefully we can talk again real soon. Sounds great. All right. So with that said, once again, thank you for listening to this week's cast. Have a great rest of the week, and we will talk to you again next time. Take care.